I always find it's best to kind of limber up a little bit before these podcasts because it's such an intensive cardio workout. But hey, are we live? It looks like we're live. What's going on, everybody? What's up? Welcome to Caliber Corner Season 4, Episode Number 232. We're still here. It is uh, Saturday morning. It's 8 a.m. Central Time here in God's Country, Nebraska. I've got a wonderful panel with me this morning. We're chipper and awake. We're just drinking some delicious. I'm not going to show it. I was going to show this coffee off, but I can't do it. Um, anyway, guys, we're going to have a good little discussion today. It's been over a year since we've had a discussion on buying used firearms. And I've got basically three or four reasons why we're doing today's show. Um, before we do that, we're going to let the panel go ahead and introduce themselves and plug their channels. We'll give a shout out on the YouTube side and see who's there. And then we will get started. So on my right, joining us uh, somewhere from the East Coast with the most, we got single shot. Single shot, what's going on, brother? How you doing? How you feeling? Oh, feeling better. I'm de definitely feeling better. I've uh, had a case of laryngitis real bad here for the last few days, and uh, trying to get uh, get rid of that. But uh, other than that, we're doing okay. Dropped a new video on uh, Rumble, so uh, cool. Everybody get a chance to check that out if you'd like to. Absolutely, man. Yeah, you came in the show Thursday when we did our Thursday evening episode. You came in at the end and you sounded, you were just like, hey, guys, what's up? It's like, whoa, somebody's definitely sick. There's a lot of crud going around right now. You start to get that that end of the end of the school year cold and cough and there's a lot of sniffles and stuff around. So you stay healthy, man. All right. You stay healthy. But uh, again, it's good to have you here and I'm glad you're back. So you guys check out uh, Single Shot over on Rumble. Channel is Daywolf. D-A-Y-W-O-L-F, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, if you're into reloading or you're curious about it or you want to learn about casting bullets and stuff, head over there and check it out. It's a really good channel, and you guys can't go wrong. So, All right, also joining us this morning, we've got Squibload. Squibload, how is your morning going today? Are you good? Are you waking up? Technical difficulties this morning. Great way to start. Dude, tell me about it. No, I know. Trust me. I've been there, done that, not just here, but in my, <laughs> my job. So, But, uh, yeah. Guys, make sure you check out the Squib Load channel. Again, great variety, a little bit of everything going on. Uh, check out Speaking Squibbish, and I think you can learn a lot, uh, you know, especially if you disagree with somebody, you know, their, their opinion on some sort of a topic. It's always neat to hear another person's point of view to hear where they're coming from. And I get, I get that sometimes from Speaking Squibbish. I really do like that series. And uh, you can find that over on the Squib Load channel. So, Squib, give us a little tease. What's coming up on the channel? Because you never know. Your channel truly is the box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get when you go there. What's coming up on the channel, man? Uh, I don't know. Let me open up the studio. <laughs> say, let me check my <laughs> check my cache of twenty five videos pending. Right, this guy's got enough. He's got he's got season three, four, and five already on lockdown. So, yep, yep. Nah, I took a week off from working on stuff. Nah, that's okay. Uh, let's see. What is today? April. Today's 20? the sixteenth. Sixteenth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. We have um, saints and sinners. Ooh, there yeah. you go. This Just is, in uh, time for Easter, huh? Yep. Saints and <laughs> I didn't even are think you gonna are you gonna that. use the pause uh the, the the egg die kit? Is that what the play you're gonna show off how that works? And so for people that don't know, no, this is uh this is a an alcoholic uh, beverage I oh. found in Iowa. <laughs> oh there you go. Okay, all right. That sounds actually kind of interesting. You do have some wonderful uh, reviews on different uh, adult beverages, you know. And uh, you do have some classic drink mixes that you put up on your channel, too. So, you guys, go check out the uh, Squibble channel. I think you're going to like it. Lots of good coffee reviews over there. So, that sounds interesting. Sounds interesting. All right, man. Well, Squibble, I'm glad you're with us. And uh, also joining us now, we've got uh, Foose. Foose, how is your morning going? Are you awake? Um, I got out of bed 15 minutes ago. Sounds good. Sounds good. But you're on time. About, you're, yeah. Yeah. yeah talking about this coffee. Uh, I realized I don't have any brewing, so I'm going to go on mute Ooh. and do that. You got to make that a priority. That's the first thing I do. Well, the first thing I do is, you know. I was yeah. hungry, so the yeah. first thing I did was get summer sausage and cheese. Mm. And now I want to get coffee. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of, of leftover tombstone pizza for breakfast. When you get yeah. up, it's like, oh, there's four pieces. I got to finish it. Mm -hmm. I got to put it down. So Yep. Half oh, for dinner, man. half for breakfast. Yep. How's, how's the competition? How's the shooting going these days? Uh, well, I, I took a little break after my last one in the middle of March, and then uh, so I'm going to start training dry firing again today. Um, Sounds good. I'm gonna yeah. Actually, I'm going to break it up. Into, I'm going to start doing two um, shorter. I, I usually dry fire for about half an hour, 45 minutes at a time. 
I'm going to break it up into two distinct um, sessions now to where one is nothing but fundamentals, gun handling, um, pulling trigger straight back, transitioning, stuff like that. And then I'm going to have another one that's more on movement, you know, coming into position, leaving position, mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, well, you got a pretty cool little setup in your basement where you get a chance to kind of rove around and, and yep. you know, practice your dry firing and stuff and definitely keep yourself in, you know, keep yourself on point. So mm -hmm. that's good, man. Yep. yep. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Cool. All now, right. And, so now, now, yeah. now, I, now that I have enough primers guaranteed for this year and next year. <laughs> so, Oh, primers. I don't remember what those, I don't remember. How, you know, I know we can get them online, but it's been a while since I've seen them on the store shelves, but I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. But uh, yeah, yeah kind at, of a, at yeah. water make at watermaker on that Sunday, I ran across the table at that's what they were selling. That's all they were selling. How are the and, prices? Um, a hundred, a thousand. So how's that compare to what you normally? It was pay? about 30, 32. Oh, before. oh, okay. So they're a, a little over double, you know? Uh, triple, triple, well, triple, triple, triple. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, yeah. so yeah. And these came in from Bosnia. So mm. I, uh, I sent a bunch of messages out and I came home with 27,000 of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, we I mean, had heard, you know, we've been told a couple months ago that some of the European, you know, yeah. theater, but, uh, primers are going to be making their way over here. So yeah. Yeah. But, uh, from what I heard is, three shipping containers from Bosnia hit like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so however many pallets could be in a shipping container, each pallet was like 3 million primers. So mm -hmm. you do that times however many could be in a shipping container times three. They're so. still going to go fast because I just think it's a situation yeah. where people see well, they're going to buy them and they don't care either. They think they're going to resell them and make money or they just want them because they don't mm -hmm. know if they're not going to find them again. So so, yeah, so the yeah. one from ones from Bosnia I heard are going to be diverted to military, but the ones from Argentina are still coming in on the regular. Okay. So. Okay. So there is hope. There is hope. And honestly, you know, I just kind of take a, a page out of Squibb's playbook. I just sign up for email notifications on a bunch of different websites, Brownells, and Graph and Sons, and then they notify me when they're in stock. And if I'm near a computer, if I want to, I can get them at that point. So, uh, not, you know, not not Chess has been having them mm -hmm. pretty much daily to multiple times a week. Um, same with Powder Valley. They've been having them, you know, releases daily to multiple times a week um you, you know a person just has to there. look around a little bit you got to put a little effort in so you there. can probably find them at local gun stores it's just a lot of people are too lazy to yeah. do it they just they don't find them online so then they complain about it and you know but i bought some yeah. bass pro for eighty a thousand so okay okay they're, they they're definitely out there you just have to do more leg work mm -hmm. gotcha, and with man. that i'm gonna go make coffee sounds good sounds good all right also joining us we've got uh kingpin kingpin's back uh, Kingpin, how's your morning going? What's going on, brother? How you doing? Uh, pretty good. Good to see everybody. Thanks for having me. Sounds good. So you posted a, a link out there in the chat. What What is that again? Firearm Specialist Channel? Is that somebody we're, uh, we're helping out, or is it just a good channel you discovered? What do we got? Yeah, it's a pretty good channel. I did a shout-out cool. for him about maybe a month or two ago. Just a, okay. Okay. a young dude that does firearm reviews. Pretty good. Excellent. Excellent. Sounds good, man. And again, Kingpin's been with us on many episodes for a long time. We'll be... Uh, Quickly approaching uh, season five here in the first week of June or last week of May. One of the two. We're only about four weeks out. But uh, anyway, let's give a little shout out on the YouTube side and see who's joining us. We got Gun Library Garrett, New York Outcast, G23, two live moves in the house, tacos and French fries. Let's see. Bearded Lunchbox is out there. Scott79, Rolling Trips joining in today. Gun Metal Guy USA, Kendrick98, New York Outcast, if I didn't mention this earlier. Tommy Gun's out there. Said he bought himself an IMI Jericho 941 police issue for a real good buy. I was looking at a Jericho 941 yesterday, uh, brand new for around 539. It was the all metal version. Really, really had my attention. So uh, Kevin June is out there today. Mountain View is watching with us. Uh, a lot of, lot of, lot of good chat going on out there. See, am I missing anybody? Mike's out there today. I'm out there apparently. Uh, William Traders in the house. All right. And yeah, I think we'll go ahead and get this party started. Uh, quick announcements here. First things first, make sure you join us on Thursdays. We generally zoom in on or we try to have a specific uh, firearm. That's usually the basis of the topic for Thursday night chats. 
Um, you know, well, last week we talked about the Walther PDP. The week before that, we discussed Glocks in general, as I've owned several. So Thursday night chats are usually centered around uh, firearms that I that I've owned before or tested on the channel and have some experience with and would like to talk about. Today's episode, you know, Saturday episodes are just kind of a free for all. They're kind of a whatever, but. Uh, today's topic is going to be buying used guns, and I've got a lot of reasons why I decided to have today's episode, what it is. Um, don't forget, we are going to be doing Thunder on the Prairie, which is June 4th, 2022, south of Lincoln, Nebraska. We're going to be at the Nebraska Shooters Range. Uh, we're going to be shooting from 9 to 5, just like the Dolly Parton song. Now that's stuck in your head, I apologize. Uh, it's going to be a good time for, we, we're we sending the invitation out to anybody, but the idea is if you have a, a YouTube channel that features any kind of firearms content, we're inviting you to come spend the day with us. Do some shooting, collaborate, uh, you know, have a little camaraderie, get a chance to shoot a couple different firearms, just have some fun at a really good range and, and have a good time. They've got all kinds of steel targets we can shoot at. We've got a rifle range, pistol range. It's going to be a good time. Um, afterwards, I think we're going to set something up for dinner and then have a little trip over to Shields to go restock our ammo before we go home. Um, I'm providing uh, some a case of 9mm to help offset the cost for people. I'm providing a case of 5.56. Uh, or 223 Remington. So if people want to just come out and shoot and just have a good time and not feel like they got to hold back, they can do that. Um, I think it's going to be a good time. We've also got Bear Creek Arsenal on board, VersaCarry, uh, Blackout Coffee Company said they supply coffee for the events, and Monster Tactical so far. And I'm going to contact a few more vendors. We're going to have some gear that we're going to show off, give people a chance of, to do some, some shooting and maybe film some videos with it if they want. And then we're going to give a bunch of the gear away at the end of the day. So it's going to be a really good time. And uh, on my channel, I'll be releasing a couple videos for some of the uppers that we're going to be giving away. Uh, they're going to be awesome. The Bear Creek Arsenal uppers. We wanted to make sure that they function. I wanted to get a chance to actually get them sighted in with the optics we're going to be testing. And uh, they're going to go to uh, a couple couple lucky attendees. So it's going to be a good time. Uh, if you want to attend Thunder on the Prairie, uh, what you can do is email me at thecalibercorner at gmail.com. And I'll put that in the, uh, let me just put that in the comments right now. And what will happen is, is I will give you the password that you need to register. And we're not trying to discourage anybody from coming, but do understand that it's going to be an event where there's going to be filming going on. If you don't want your face on camera, don't come. All right. Uh, because there's a possibility that you could show up in video somewhere. Um, also, you know, if you want to get a channel going or you want to see how this works, you're kind of curious about it, feel free to show up. It's 25 bucks for the day. They've also got lodging for up to two days. And the cost of lodging is just a free will offering, whatever you feel like giving when you leave. And that's it. You don't have a set fee or anything to stay there. They got air conditioning, Wi-Fi, kitchenette, pool table. Um, it's bathrooms, bunk beds, everything you need. So you're going to be all set to go. Uh, New York Outcast said, why did you get a bunch of chamber flags? Are they required for the range or something? Yeah. So New York Outcast, uh, Monster Tactical just sent us a bunch of bags of, of, of uh, chamber flags. And they also sent us three optics. Um, the chamber flags, they just sell them. Uh, when our guns are at the range, they're supposed to be flagged when they're sitting out, unloaded when you're not shooting them. Um, I also just keep them flagged when they're on the racks behind me, just as a general rule, so people can glance and know that your gun is unloaded. Um, we don't have range marshals. We pretty much have to marshal ourselves, if you will, or range officers. So the chamber flags are nice because it kind of gives people peace of mind that they're not walking down range with a loaded gun pointing at them from somebody else. So speaking of loaded guns, we've got Defense Dad with us this morning. Defense Dad, how's your morning going? What's going on, brother? Oh, I had some issues. No, I, I should be good. Uh, we always have issues. I had some issues yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I uh, I decided to uh, take one to the face from the 450 Bushmaster with the scope. I was a little too close and didn't realize how much kick 450 Bushmaster actually has. But uh, it was worth it. It was worth it, man. Uh, hey, so tell us about your channel. What's coming up? What's going on, man? I just got done talking about Thunder on the Prairie 2022. Okay. And, oh, you guys can also email defensedad1 at gmail.com if you'd rather go that route, too. So, yeah. Uh, well, I got I did, got to do some uh, filming tomorrow, and I'm going to get some reviews out on some of the stuff for Thunder on the Prairie. Um, mm -hmm. But that's about it for what's coming up. Excellent, excellent. Guys, make sure you check out Defense Dad's channel. It's going to be a good time. I probably and, have uh, enough yeah. stuff coming up from there just to – film all the way through june <laughs> yeah so defense dad and i just as a heads up we've been you know we're sharing uh these items that we're going to be giving away we want to make sure everything functions make sure everything's good to go zeroed so we're not wasting time at the range so you're going to see some similar video releases between the two of us we're also at the range at the same time helping each other out with spotting and stuff but you're going to get two unique takes on you know the same equipment so i think that's kind of cool to see what i think about it versus what you think about it how you shoot with it how i shoot with it uh, pros and the cons, but I was actually pretty impressed yesterday with what we tested out. Everything worked well. 
and uh, I had a lot of fun. We were out there. I was out there for at least four hours yesterday. You were out there for seven or eight because <laughs> you're out there shooting with the daughter. Yeah, we shot for a couple hours before I met up with you. I was I was cold. I was kind of chilled to the bone when I got home. <laughs> it's, up. it's not warming up in Nebraska. It was it was it was the high was 51 yesterday. It was like 39, 40 degrees when we we're at the range. I mean, when you're shooting, you're not thinking about it. The defense dad here rolls up in shorts. You know, no Ooh. coat on, right? I feel like his mom telling him to My bundle up so he in doesn't. Trunk. Yeah, but I mean, you're sitting in the overhang of the shade and the wind's blowing. It's freezing out there, man. I mean, I, I mean, I, I was fine. But... <sighs> all right, all right. Well, at least you're you're okay. You didn't get hypothermia. We didn't have to rescue you, so that's definitely a bonus. But um, it was a good day for shooting. What's that? He doesn't have hypothermia, but his uh, pinky finger may be a little purple. Yeah, there you go. There you uh, go. A little well, too much. His index you. finger. Yeah. You walk in, you don't realize how cold you are, and then you warm up and you get tired. So I yeah. laid down to take an hour nap, and then I woke up halfway through Gary's show and decided it wasn't worth coming back on at that point. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> oh, man, but it was a good time. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot of content coming out on our channels the next couple weeks. I usually just do one video per week, so I'll do this. Uh, one of them this week on Wednesday. I usually go Wednesday. It's kind of a midweek breakup, you know, for my releases on videos. So it's going to be a good time. It's going to be fun. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay. Are you, uh, you going to so, have a collab? Uh, we, no, we didn't. I don't think we did on any of these particular videos. No, we're going to film. I mean, I did shout out to Defense Dad. He was spotting for me when we were shooting yesterday. But uh, no, we're going to just be doing two different sets of content, but it's going to be the same products. Yep. All right. Uh, what do we got going on here? So don't forget about the Thursday show, which is six o'clock central time. That's a caliber corner weekly edition. I mentioned that earlier. So why, why the discussion on used guns? I've got four reasons why we're having today's topic. First of all, on Thursday, there was a person, I, Jamie, something or another was in the chat mentioning that they had some money. They were looking for a gun. They were looking for some advice. They already had a gun. I think they were either trading or whatnot. So we just started, you know, spouting out all these different options and possibilities. The Fed made the comment, hey, don't don't forget the used case at your local gun store. So that really had me thinking it's been a while since we've had a used gun discussion. It's been over a year. It was January of 2021, if I'm not mistaken, when we discussed it last time. Um, also, uh, there's a ton of used guns in the used gun case, at least for us locally. It is packed. Every time I go in there, there's something different. All the shelves are full of used guns. We're starting to see those guns trickle back in that people bought during the pandemics, during the riots. And these guns, I mean, what I'm looking at, everything I'm inspecting, other than a few here and there, these things look like they're brand new. I mean, you take them apart and look at them. There's very little wear marks on them. There's very little, I mean, underneath the slide, you check it. They're, you know, the, the polymers brand. or the metals are in great shape. The finishes look they perfect. Are brand. The, yeah, they are I mean, brand I think they either bought them and never shot them or they bought them and maybe did a box of rounds or a couple rounds to make sure they knew how to make it run. And now they're selling it back. And with the economy tanking or being you know, not as good as it could be, that's a $500 you know, investment, $400 investment just sitting there that that person could get back. Yeah, so, also, so, out of, hold on a second. Out of the last five or six guns that I bought, they've all been used. I'm sitting there thinking, my God, I bought nothing. But now, granted, I got a couple from Defense Dad, but I've also bought some at Shields or bought them around the area. And I've gotten some really, really good deals. So there's some basics you want to think about before you buy a used gun there's a lot of things to take into consideration i know if you just want it you don't care you're going to buy it but for somebody who wants to save some money that's thinking about going used there's some things you want to take into consideration all right go ahead Poos. i was gonna say most of the used guns in the used case are basically brand new i mean yeah of course you get you know yeah, like one out of 20 fire. looks like it's either been holster carried a lot or if you one way to tell like one if easy that. way you can usually tell because they'll have like aftermarket grip tape on it. Those are always the ones that have all the wear on them. You know, the guy that you could tell they were serious about carry because they've always got the aftermarket grip carrier. There's like an optic on it or, you know, it looks a little yeah. scuffed up, looks a little beat up, you know, and, and, and those the ones that carry a lot like us that carry a lot. How <laughs> often do we sell our carry guns? We, we could add another carry gun to it, but a lot of times it's not. I, so, I don't see carry guns in the use safe. Use well, I guess I guess I mean anything's a carry gun. I'm just saying, like I tend to see a lot of a lot of a lot of the smaller frame pistols, a lot of the compacts that tend to show up more often uh, than anything that looks like it has the most wear on it. But mean, I used to trade up. I'd always want to get a more expensive gun, so I trade up, and so that's usually what I that's what I did before. But now I don't. Yeah, I don't really sell or move out my carry guns anymore. I hold on to them for at least. Three or four years, and if something better comes along, then I can justify maybe trading up on it. Um, and, and various reasons, maybe I want to increase capacity, maybe I want a different caliber, you know, because we're all dreaming about 30 super carry. All of us want 30 super carry. So, um, you know, oh, so hell that's no. why. <laughs> Just seeing if you guys are awake. <laughs> um, 
So, so a couple of things to, to take into consideration here. Um, if you're buying it used, if you can buy it from somebody, you know, that's always a good way to do it. Cause you know, that person should be honest with you. If they're a friend, they should not be jacking you over. Not that a gun couldn't break or have problems, but they're going to, I would personally rather buy from somebody I know just it, just because I'll know the wear and tear on it, that it's been taken care of or not, or know if there's problems with it or not. So they're going to, there's going to be a lot more disclosure there versus buying it randomly. Also, I'm still a member of MeWe. MeWe is basically like like Facebook, but they don't use your data and sell it to other companies. MeWe is a wonderful place where a bunch of us that got booted out of Facebook in the gun selling groups like five or six years ago, we went over to MeWe because they don't care. As long as you're not breaking state law, you can have a group for whatever you want, whatever you're into. And so I belong to all of us that were on Facebook, just went over to MeWe. So I know a lot of these people because you see like somebody advertises it. And a person say, hey, bought it. Thanks. You know, good doing business with you. You start to kind of build a little bit of a circle and you recognize some of the names. So that's a good way for us to go. If you can do private sales in Nebraska, that's wonderful. Um, you just got to make sure you follow whatever your local laws and regulations are. You know, you can always go through a dealer transfer for the purchase or the sale if you really want to. You know, if you want to do the actual process of the re-registration and stuff. Just for peace of mind, which it's not necessary in Nebraska for, for certain kinds of firearms and transactions. Um, and, also, and, yeah. and certain Go individuals ahead. would, pro, you know, there's been times where in certain individuals are like, hey, I want this. I bought it from a, especially if they're a, a newer gun owner, they'll be like, hey, I, I bought this from a shop. I would rather go through a shop and to sell it to you and, and then do the 4473 and all that stuff. It's still really no big deal. Now, like out of state transfers for handguns, I, I I believe it has to go through a dealer. You have to officially. That's what I did with the two that I sold out were out of state. So you, yeah. yes, you, you have to send it to F, an FFL. Mm -hmm. Like an individual can send it directly to an FFL dealer. They have to put it in the into their books, say where they got it from, the individual, and then turn around and um, do the transfer and everything to um, the in state buyer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Pew Pew says Indiana is a free state uh, where you can do and sell private. You can do private sales as well. You can in Nebraska if you have a carry permit and the other person has a carry permit. You can do private sales that don't require on handguns that don't require a dealer background check. Uh, Defense dad, can they also have a pistol purchase permit too? Is that everybody I've ever done business with has a carry permit? Uh, well, here in Lincoln, if you only have a little bit of pistol purchase <laughs> permit. You have to uh, you have to file it with the sheriff with the either the sheriff's the office LPD or the police, police department. department. LPD, you have to record yeah. this. You have to record the sale. Outside is, of Lincoln, I don't think yeah. that's as much of a requirement. No, it's 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 not that registration thing. I I think it was either just a pistol purchase permit or a valid uh, concealed carry permit for handgun sales. Now, long guns, they just have to be able to legally buy or sell a firearm, and they have to be I think eighteen or something, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, to do the purchase, and that's it. So it's 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 somewhat lenient. But like I've said before, Nebraska is just, we're bass backwards. We're, uh, don't even get me started. So anyway, um, yeah. So when you're looking at these used guns, you know, if you can go through somebody, you know, that's always kind of nice. Uh, gun groups you might belong to, that's great. Also, make sure you know what kind of a warranty the firearm has. And I know a lot of you might not care. You just want to buy it anyway. But, you know, you buy a Glock, which if you look at Glock's website, it says, it, you know, the warranty is good for one year to the original purchaser. And it has to be registered within 30 days of purchase. You have to register it online with them in order to activate your warranty. Now, that's just Glock. Um, my favorite companies are the ones that just have an unlimited warranty, regardless of the buyer or transferee or whatnot. Um, I know like Ruger does this. Smith & Wesson does this also. Uh, I'm sure there's a million other companies. I know Sky does, High Point, right? So they've got these lifetime warranties. So the only reason why is if you get something and say that gun's no longer in production and something breaks, and you can't find a spring for it or a part, which is pretty rare these days in the age of the internet, but you might have a model that's just kind of unique that's been out of production, or maybe it's an import and there's not much out there. If it has a lifetime warranty, it's nice to have because you can send it into the dealer or send it into the company to get it repaired. You guys want to make any comments on the warranties at all? What do you think? Is it a big deal? Do you really care about that at all or not? I mean, some people don't um, care. We don't, us gun guys don't care, but somebody who's buying just one might care, well, you know? It yeah, can yeah. be, especially if you're buying used. Like I bought, that Ruger SR45, I thought I was just going to love because I liked my SR9 a lot. And it had issues. And, but um, that, that stuff got, so I was, a, I don't know if I was the second or third or fourth, whatever owner on that one, but Ruger fixed it for me. You had a broken guide rod, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And oh. what was weird is, and, and that's the other thing too, when you're buying it from the gun store or you're buying it from like, like this was from Shields where you bought it, not to knock on them, but 
I thought they would test fire it before they actually take ownership of it to buy it off you when you trade well, a gun. Well, the shield specifically I, doesn't have a range to do that. But so I oh, I thought they did. I wrote. I noticed it was broken before I bought it. Ah, okay, okay. So they sent it in for warranty work before I purchased it. There was wasn't well, like I cool. didn't didn't inspect it. <clears throat> so I told them I wouldn't buy it unless it was fixed, unless they dropped a lot of money off of it. Yeah, yeah, because you're and you might be, you might have trouble finding parts for it. Who knows if the SR45 has been out of production for so many years? I, there's always an aftermarket supplier for everything, but you know if you want the original parts or whatnot. Uh, somebody made a comment earlier. Maybe it was G23 mentioning that uh, if you can't take the at least take the slide off or take the gun apart at a minimal level to inspect it before you buy it, he's not going to buy it. So yeah, so like so like my situation with the Shadow Two I was looking at, it was uh, originally a thousand bucks used sitting in the use case. The Shadow Two was in, it was around December. Still sitting in the case two months later, it was marked down to nine forty nine. I had fifty dollars in gift cards. I said, "Let's take a look at it." And so I said, "Can I take the slide off?" They said, "Yeah, let's let's take it apart." So we took the slide off and looked at it. Same situation with my carry gun. Looked like it was brand new. There was no marks on the hammer where it hit the the fire the rear of the you know the firing pin. Uh, I mean, it looked like it was brand new inside. I said, "Fix the the foos. And He's like, "Dude, that thing's never been fired before." I mean, it was still immaculate. Not one grain of carbon inside of it. So I'm like, "Yeah, I'll take it. No problems at all." Now, and I didn't even think about the warranty. That's a thousand dollar gun. If it doesn't have a warranty, what am I going to do? But a gun like that's fairly easy to repair. Springs are readily available. But if I bought something obscure, like say maybe like an EA, you know, witness model from ten years ago, and something breaks and I can't get it fixed, what do I do? So warranty always something good to consider if possible when you're buying it. Also, if you can, definitely inspect it when you check it out. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Like one, one thing I don't do is. Like when the Shadow Twos came out, there was a huge influx of people buying the first generation. Um, if you look like if you look at the first ones that came out versus the ones that are now, they feel different in your hand and they look different on the inside because there there were some there were some stretched uh, stress areas that cracked on the frames. Um, so like that's one thing I don't do is I. Whenever a first gun first comes out, I wait at least a year for teething issues to be solved. You know, the P365, I have one. I love it. I wanted one as soon as they first came out. I didn't buy it for two years. Teething. Um, whenever you do go to um, gun shops and used markets, look and like, don't you be like, oh, this is uh, what exactly what I want, If especially if it's a newer gun. Mm -hmm. sign look and see when it was manufactured don't uh, i i would not personally i don't buy the first year um production run of anything yeah it just seems like anymore with guns there i don't know if they're just doing less testing on the gun before it hits the market it seems like us customers are the beta testers on everything anymore cars guns i mean it just seems like like a lot of stuff just there's and there's going to be problems and there can be problems it's a tool it's got moving well, parts you know a lot of times what it seems like like well, i'll see these new gun reviews and they'll have jamming issues or they'll have something break on it or you know so well, I, I do agree with you yeah well it, it's it's every gun's different every gun has a little mm -hmm. bit different tolerances the ammo is used like a gun company or a vehicle company they're not gonna be able to go through everything and these pieces and stuff that break it may be very few of them have this issue, but it's still an issue. And I mean, yeah. that's that just what I, what I don't buy any, any first generation of anything. Um, yeah, whether I, I learned that firsthand the other day, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what happened to you, Defense? I can't remember. Are you talking about the G3C or what? No, I thought I was going to really love that Smith & Wesson CSX just because of all the oh. how it was built. And yeah. then I rented it, and that, that triggers a dumpster fire. So, that, yes, yeah, the new CSX, which looks like, a, looks like a little 1911, for those that don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you yeah, know, I so. carry a P938, and I'm left-handed, and that CSX is completely ambidextrous, so I got excited about it. But I shot it right next to the Shield Plus. I rented both of them, and that Shield Plus is a hell of a lot better shooting gun, at least right now. It, but the CSX is a first-year production, so. So the ultimate would be if that gun store that you're at happens to have a range and they've got a use case and they got that gun that you're thinking about buying used, if you can shoot it ahead of time, that'd be great, especially if you don't have any experience with it, uh, to really give you an idea. Because it might look cool online, they might be hyping it up as like the next greatest thing since sliced bread. 
And then you shoot, you're like, oh, this thing is trash or this thing is just not good. Mm -hmm. And again, I do agree with Foose. Like my P365 that I bought was made in February of 2020. I went back and did the tracing on the date of manufacture because I couldn't find it on the box anywhere. And it had, had gone through four different revisions before my model had arrived. They had recoil the spring change that happened and extract. No, no, the P365. Oh, oh. They had, they had changed out the sights. They had a batch that went out there with bad x-ray night, night sights. And so they changed those out. It had uh, recoil it rod and spring issues that had been swapped out. Not my gun, but this is the changes that SIG had made to that P365. And here you would think that six hour, you know, man, they're going to, it's going to be, they're going to run a million rounds through before it hits the customers, right? I don't think that was the situation, or maybe it wasn't really initially designed to handle the kind of wear and tear people were putting on those things. Um, so yeah, so yeah, definitely. There's nothing wrong with buying used, but you could be running, you could be buying a first gen or first run model of something. So do some research before you buy used. Definitely check around online to know what the prices should be for that gun. Um, so you might be able I, to negotiate that a little bit. Yeah, I, I definitely know some companies uh, batch test firearms. Um, there is a a company here in Kansas City that I know several people that work there. Uh, any t you know any new designs coming out, they run pallets through a selected number of them. Or okay. hey, he here's a new batch of frames. We're gonna build one up and we're gonna run, you know, six thousand rounds through it. They'll load magazines and they'll just toss the gun from person to person to person and run them. Yeah. So, but I mean, they may put, you know, 3,000 rounds in a day and be like, okay, that's good. Yeah. So, yeah. It's yeah, a different or you size might, you might, or, or you may get a first gen gun that has no problems at all. You know, I mean, there's always yeah. a possibility it's not going to have issues, but it seems like there always seems to be something wrong these days with a new gun as soon as it hits the market. There's some kind of iffiness about it. Even major companies like I've seen, you know, the Smith and Wesson MP 10 millimeters, right? I mean, there's, there's people that show a lot of jamming videos going on, but, and there could be a million reasons why that happens. It could be bad ammo. Yeah, it, maybe they, you know, maybe it, it was just a. It could be a break-in period. Well, yeah. I mean, it could it could be a spring, and the ammo they're shooting is a little bit lighter. You know, it's there's so many different different ammo manufacturers out there, and they all load to their same quote unquote spec. Um, I mean, it's all within semi spec, but you know, one may have, I don't know, five grains of whatever powder in there, and someone else may have an equivalent of you know 4.5 so if you do that the recoil is going to be different and the gun's going to uh, handle it different yeah no i agree totally um so some things to consider you know when you're when you're looking at these guns you know that one thing i would probably do if it looks like it's got some wear on it you know it's relatively inexpensive many times to, re to replace the recoil spring or maybe take it to the range and see how it runs but so you've got a, like an older SIG or maybe a Glock or something. It looks like it's got some wear on it or, you know, the person's put some serious rounds through, but you want to get it anyway because it's a good deal. Um, you know, recoil, you know, your guide rod combination recoil spring units are usually not that expensive. Recoil springs are fairly inexpensive. Um, and we'll kind of talk about specific models, what to look for if you're going to be going used. So that's something that you definitely want to do. A couple things real quick before you take that used gun home, check and see and, and see what it comes with. Are you just buying that gun with that one mag? Does it come with a mag? Does it have all three mags that came with the gun, or, gun, gun originally? Like, see, ask to see what kind of accessories come with the gun. The case, is any of that stuff there? Because as gun guys, we sometimes just misplace things, you know, and you might get that cool gun with that optic cut, and then you get the case and there's no Allen wrench for it. There's no base plates that come with it. There's no manual. I mean, there might be a lot of things you don't get with it. It might just be as is. So you want to make sure that the accessories are in there if possible, especially if there's like back straps and you can, you want to change those out and then you open the case and there's none in there. I noticed that a lot with the police trade-ins. A lot of the times you just get the gun with one mag or the gun with two mags and you don't get the back straps with the gun or the little tools you need to, to work on the gun for whatever reason. So be and careful when are, you go that route. So you might be uh, saving money, but not saving money on the other end, right? A, a lot of police trade-ins, they're a popular enough gun you could get those. But if it's, you know, like, oh, geez. Um, Oh crap! There, there is a uh, well, kind of like think about the um, that Magpul trigger the thing or oh shit, what's it called? The bad lever. Yeah, the bad lever. There is the screw on that is extremely tiny and um, it's a one of those star ones, oh. something that everyone doesn't have. Like a like, Torx one or yeah. something, or like a hex yeah. one point five millimeter. 
yeah, do so, the, so it, if ahead, it's if, if there is something on that gun that is if it's not a very popular gun a lot of the popular guns well no a lot of the guns that aren't overly popular they have proprietary sizes of stuff so you may do want to look at that and sig's the same way um sig's the only popular gun that has proprietary everything on it which is weird but yeah sig uh, you know, you're talking about those screws, and this is just totally unrelated. But uh, the Magpul, the little, the little um, MOE trigger guards that you install, they've got the weirdest size, tiny screw that screws in, and they don't give you an Allen key for it or a hex key for it at all. And I mean, I have to like, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. I've got like four sets of hex keys and Allen keys and Torx screws down in my Torx wrenches down in my toolbox, and like none of them fit. In fact, I did find one eventually, and I painted it like silver because I always do that little trigger guard swap on my ARs. And they just, they use the dumbest size screw that nothing will fit in. I don't know. Maybe other guys have better luck with it, but little things like that, just little unique things like that. You really got to watch out for. Um, and here's the thing, like, let's just say you get the gun and it only comes with one mag and say the new gun comes with three and you save 50 bucks buying it used. Well, now you got to go buy two mags at $35 a piece. You didn't save any money. Mm -hmm. So always find out what it comes with before you take it home. Just because I could see a person, you know, taking the two mags out and selling them on the side. And then you get one mag with a gun and it's used uh there was a comment earlier about the police trade-ins there's those prices are starting to go back down now we're starting to see some of the uh, m p's especially like the 40s for like 349 dollars you know they used to be 299 same at with the glocks. very bottom what's that same with glocks yeah same. the glock like a lot of your your 40 cal uh glocks i'm not sure what those models are but you tend to see some good deals on those occasionally some g17s will pop up like some gen threes but you really really want to look around because you might be thinking that you're getting a good deal and and you're really not um, but again, it really comes down to doing your research before you before you do so. When it comes um, to getting extra mags with a used gun, I've had a couple different experiences with that. Okay. Uh, most of my use, or I should say, used handgun. We're specific about handguns in this this uh, show. So most of my used handguns are mil serps. I only have one used handgun that I can think of that's that's not mil serp. I bought it from a coworker, and it came with three mags it came with one factory mag and two wilson combat mags or maybe it came with four mags maybe it was one factory mag and three wilson combat mags mm -hmm. and those wilson combat mags cost a little bit more and i bought it for uh msrp he he wanted to he was doing the whole caliber consolidation thing at the time and this was the only thing he had in that caliber and it was it, it hadn't been used a lot but it had been used i knew the guy and, and he wasn't going to sell me a lemon and uh he he sold it to me for what i would have paid for it brand new in the gun case but it came with the extra mags and his thing was if he trades it in he's not going to get crap for it mm -hmm. so it's kind of a wash and i was okay with it and it's I've, a win-win yeah it's a win-win uh so sometimes you can have that but I would not necessarily pay full price or over full price if somebody said it's coming with it. It, it comes with ten max, right? You know, uh, or or some something like that. I know some people that will accessorize their gun or buy a ton of mags or things like that for them and go. When I go to sell this, I can sell it for more than what I paid for it because I put all this money into it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. If it, if this hadn't been somebody I knew at work, I would have probably talked him down on the price or would have walked away maybe but um uh or or maybe if it's a friend that needs some money and they're like you know man i, I can't get anything for this at the pawn shop would you buy it from this price at, at this price you know yes and i always have a deal that if i buy it from you at this price even if you come back years later and want to buy it back from me you're going to pay the exact same price you know maybe okay. plus the transfer fee right but yeah, if, if they yeah. start throwing things in there and, and trying to jack up the price by throwing things in, I don't necessarily – no, dude, that's on you. If you want to sell these mags separately on eBay or something like that, go right ahead. But don't use this as a as – a, as a, I can't help that you bought 30 mags for this thing, right? Or Squib, how about adding an optic? I always see a lot of ARs on MeWe where it's like a PSA AR and they want like 800 for it and it's a $400 gun because yes. they put an ACOG on the top of it. It's like I'm not saving anything by buying your gun. You're not giving me a good deal. Well, yeah. sort of you are, but I'll talk about that in a sec. But it's like if you're gonna put a bunch of mall ninja stuff on it. I don't really that I'll just I would honestly rather just strip it off and just sell the gun as is and make a quick sale and right. then keep those accessories, you know. And, and I look at it, I look at it with the same rule of thumb as uh sporterizing. 
right? Uh-huh. If I quarterize it, I'm giving you, I'm giving you very, very little money. And I, well, I put an eight hundred dollars stock on it. I don't care, dude. You ruin the collector value. Yep. Now with with the mill serps that I bought at the time that I purchased them, I purchased them online, haven't shipped to my FFL. A lot of times they would offer those mags and maybe even a holster, a mill mil serp holster or something like that on the same website at the same time. And I would go ahead and throw on a mag or two because a year later, when those mill serp pistols started to dry up, the mags dried up. And now it became harder to get the mags. And every now and then they would come into the, the country and the price would be up or Metgar would make a copy of it and, and uh, you know the price would be higher. So yeah. if you're buying a mill serp online, say from and I'm not endorsing them either, classic yeah. firearms as an example or something, and they offer the mag at that time, it might be a good idea to go ahead yep. and pick that up right then and there. I'm Toker Revs or oh, Star BMs. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. I, I was in Star BMs that they're uh-huh. still relatively cheap, but good luck finding mags for them. Yeah, nobody that... ever made an aftermarket for that, did they, Foose? No. It's whatever's coming in there, and people, you know, and they made a lot of mags, yeah, but whenever they import the guns, they, you know, sometimes they'll import just the guns and a mag that's in it and that's it because they know that very few people are going to be carrying this or it's going to be a high use gun so they don't worry about it but then also the mags come in you know it's something they do it like i have a a toker uh was it model 70 or something is that that see a model 70 that's uh 32 auto that's a toker of design oh whenever i bought it there's a yeah, yeah, there's a yeah, yeah, yeah. I went. And I bought. Whenever I bought it, I threw in five more mags, and it's like, oh yeah, because I know, you go out there right now, you can't find them. Yeah, like, now I'll I'll buy a the, surplus. With, with the M70 and the M88, when they were coming in used, uh, you at, at first you could buy extra mags, and then those dried up. But then the Stava USA, they set up a, a location here. It's more mm-hmm. or less a distribution point, not manufacturing. They started selling the parts. So they stocked the parts in America and those parts included magazines, but it was years later. I think I did a video on uh, Zestava mags, finally being able to buy new production M88 and M70 mags. But it it must have been two, three, four years, maybe more uh, after after, uh, a bunch of their used stuff come in. And they also started making or they, they started releasing more of their new production on that because you can buy an, an older m70 or a newer m70 but you can't always count on the company going hey there's a market for this maybe we should put a warehouse in america and mm-hmm. keep the part you know sometimes yeah. you just luck out there but yeah magazines are definitely a consideration whether you're buying at a store whether you're buying from a private owner or whether you're you're into mill serp used handguns just real quick, guys, Makarovs, if you're a Makarov owner, um, Apex Gun Parts makes new manufacturer stainless steel mm-hmm. mags, and they're great. I've got a yeah, couple of them in there. Yeah, those are definitely, so don't feel like you need to go buy a, you know, a janky surplus mag that may or may not have a functional, like a decent spring to it and stuff. Just go buy a brand new one from Apex, you know, for unless like, you want the originals just for like a collector value, but yeah. And, and uh, the Apex ones, they work they work well. They're relatively, mm-hmm. relatively cheap, like twenty bucks, something like that. Yeah, yeah, they're very fair. Um, I mean, yeah. So, for new manufacturer mag, yeah, yeah, definitely. it's like you know, what with, with Makarovs, new manufacturer or surplus, eh, you're going to be spending the same money. So, if you mm-hmm. have a cool factor for, hey, this is all surplus, all made in whatever country, fine. But if you just want something that works. Mm-hmm. And, and if you've got a, a an older used gun that you purchase, whether it be mill serp or, or not, check Wolf Springs to see if mm-hmm. they've got magazine springs for it. Yep. Oh, you yeah. know, they're worn out, but the, yeah. the base plate, the follower, and the body are in good mm-hmm. shape. You can always just swap out springs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, when I bought my when I got my Makarov, uh, got it from another YouTuber. We did a swap, we did a trade, and um, I yeah, I got the recoil spring from Wolf for like twelve dollars. I just got a factory replacement spring, runs great. Not that it had a problem before, but I thought, well. Let's put a new spring on it because the old one's probably 30 years old minimum because it was a 90s production gun. Yeah, so. and, and then you go to the cesium model 82 and 83. The mags are interchangeable. So mm-hmm. that there's some stuff like that. If they make the same gun in a 380 and 9 Mac, the, the, it's going to be interchangeable. So if you are looking to rebuild those mags, though, as far as the springs, make sure, like some of those older guns, like I have one where it's, not really feasible to rebuild a mag so just keep that one for what travis was saying for the cool factor but get a newer one that runs better like for example my 
my grandpa, and I, this is a 22, but still, it's my grandpa's Mark One. Can't right, really rebuild yeah. those mags. Uh, he only had one magazine, and it'll, it unless you if you put more than six rounds in that one, it jams up. It's pressed together, so I can't really without potentially ruining it. I can't really rebuild it, <clears throat> so I keep it. But I have other mags for it, so mm-hmm. just kind of look at avail- availability on those things too. Okay, so let's uh, let's go and get into it then. Uh, Kendrick ninety eight says, "What should we watch out for when buying used?" All right, so let's talk uh, twenty two semi automatic used. Okay, we're talking maybe the Taurus TX twenty two, maybe anything from the Ruger Mark series or uh, Browning Buck Mark. Uh, if we're talking, so Defense Dad, you've got some wear and tear on that Ruger. Have you had to replace anything on it? Like, if somebody was going to buy one used, what kind of issues would they run into? Obviously, the magazine could be one thing that's going to need to be not replaced, but you're going to want to get another one for it, right? So the, what would you notice on those Ruger Mark series? Because that's one of the most popular semi-automatic 22s in the world. Right. What, what would you want to watch for if you're buying one? I know they got the new series that break open and you can pull out the bolt carrier group like an AR. But what would you say from one of the older ones? What do you want to watch out for? Um, for those magazine, if it's a Mark One or Mark Two, because, you they, again, they're pressed. They're kind of a – well, the base plate's pressed in, so you can't really rebuild them very easily. You, you can if you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um. Firing extractor pin. rejector issues at all springs that wear out anything you've just noticed that have really started to show some wear after two generations of use essentially not on my particular one but they're easy enough to replace the you, if you for like obvious things like if you have someone who didn't really know what they're doing the mainspring housing on those people don't stop and think about how to do it so they'll, be, they'll use some sort of metal pry bar to get it out that sort of thing on the handle mm-hmm. um be honest with you, most of the used ones that those that come out, they're in pretty good shape because uh, most people are so afraid of how to take those things down and clean them. They like it's a gun down. that people don't <laughs> ever take the time; they literally like take it to a gunsmith because <clears throat> they get it apart and they don't know how to put it back together. I'm like, which with the age of YouTube, I don't understand that. Yeah, you just got to watch a couple of videos before you do it and feel comfortable with it, and then just step by step take your time. Like the first time I ever cleaned my Air 15, the first time I bought it. No experience whatsoever. I spent like two hours doing it. I'm like, okay, I gotta pull that out. Okay, we're gonna wipe that off. Get the Q-tips in there. Got to get this lubricated. I mean, it literally was like, but now it's like 15 minutes for me to totally clean yeah. the gun all the way through. You know. And so yeah, guns, you just it's not impossible. I mean, I even did a a Ruger. Help me out here. What's the like the anodized ones with the polymer lower? What are the, what series are those again? The mark like the Mark IV, Mark III lights. Yeah, the lights. I mean, that thing was a beast. In fact, I never did. There was somebody out there that had a wonderful cleaning video on it. I watched it. They gave you some pro tips in it. I followed the process, had no trouble with it because I kept hearing all these horror stories about how hard of a gun that was to disassemble and clean. And it's not. You just need to spend some time. And a lot of people don't want to do that. You know, they're going to yeah. read some step by steps that pop up on a Google search and then think they're going to figure it out. And then they end up breaking something or bending a spring or ruining something. Hey, just watch my video on it. I can take it down and put it back together in 30 seconds. <laughs> Absolutely. See, that's all you got to know. That's all you got to know. Well, those um, things particularly, they're, they're hard to really mess up because they're built like a, they're kind of like a built yeah. like a cross between a cannon and, a, and an AR because the upper separates from the lower. They're, the complete upper is milled out of one piece of steel. I mean, and it's so modular. It's, it's that That's a pretty safe one. Plus, from the get-go, those guns... It's always been in the, in the owner's manual. They're safe to dry fire, so you don't have too yeah. many issues with firing pins compared to some to most other 22s. So yes, uh, Jay Hike says, "Look at the breach and chamber face." I noticed that a lot of 22s, you tend to get like your yeah your chamber area really tends to get chewed up with high wear. A lot of these, especially if it's like a like a fixed barrel, there's just a lot of wear and tear that happens on that block right there. So you want to look and see that it's also you know extractors and ejectors. You want to make sure that those can be replaced because they could be worn out. A lot of your 22s are going to have some high round count on them because people 300, 400 rounds at a time, right? I mean, those things can be – that can be high wear points. Yeah. So that that's – on 22s, I look at firing mm-hmm. pin because a lot of people ah. don't understand that you should – Firing pin or firing bar. I always call it like a firing bar because yeah. a lot of times it's a little bar that strikes the, strikes the case. But, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's something you want to watch out for. Make sure that you can get replacement parts. Or, again, if you don't care, you're not going to care. Maybe you just want something to tinker with. But it would suck to drop three or $400 on something and you're going to have problems with it. Also, maybe do some research on that model. If it's gets pretty low ratings or they're noted to have lots of problems, you might want to pass on that model um, and just go for something else. But definitely a good good little bit of, uh, of advice there. SR-22, yeah, the Ruger SR-22, if you can get one of those used, those are definitely a solid price. One more I'm thing not a- I would say about uh, 22s in general is mm-hmm. 
find a way to look down the barrel because so many people mm-hmm. at 22 just use that cheap thunderbolt or go whatever just to let in your rifling in your barrels gonna get just absolutely compact with lead and then it's mm-hmm. just not gonna shoot very well when i got my when i got my grandpa's like it was it was bad so that, that's a pretty common thing on 22s because people shoot so much if they shoot the cheap uncoated lead ammo it, your rifling is going to be full of lead most likely mm-hmm. and again you can get some you can get some some solution to clean that out and stuff but I mean, so you might look down the barrel and think that the rifling shot it might just be totally full it just might need to might need a good thorough you know like bore solvent put down the put down the pipe essentially to to, to get all that lead out of those grooves right uh who's were you gonna say something i'm sorry uh no, no not really okay okay uh patriot in the dark says with the buck mark uh make sure you get that square rubber recoil stop they're cheap but it takes a while to get maybe ordering the original factory parts uh something you need to watch for okay what about what about 22 revolvers you know you get a lot of uh heritage rough riders that show up in the used market uh ruger wranglers pop up in the used market some old h and r revolvers what i mean i would say that the the 22 revolver a lot of what we're telling you is going to carry over into the revolver realm mm-hmm. but then also you know and then what we're going to talk about with the 22 revolver also carries over into the full-size revolver realm right so what do you want to watch for say in a 22 revolver is it even lock, worth buying one lock, used or are you better off just buying new lock so up. cheap lockup yeah, is going to be a big one that right off the uh right off the gate all right like the the heritage rough rider is a fairly inexpensive gun mm-hmm. so what kind of how much less are you paying for a used one? Yeah, I mean, they're like $125 or like $150 if you want it with a Magnum cylinder. Granted, you're going to be looking at, oh, the one thing we forgot to mention, one of the advantages of buying used, if you don't buy it from a gun store, you buy it from a friend. And Squid, this is like you're talking about buying a person-to-person sale. No sales tax. That's that's the most beautiful thing right there. I hate paying sales tax. Okay. So if I can save forty dollars on a on a you know eight hundred dollar gun and get it for seven hundred, so you're saving money right there on tax and possibly shipping if you were to buy it online and a transfer fee. So I mean, you could save a okay. hundred dollars out of the gate right there just buying a used gun, especially if it's from a private sale. Because I mean, if these things are selling for one twenty five or one fifty, and the person wants you know one fifteen or one forty, it's like, no, dude, I'm not for ten. I mean, I know some people sell their mom for ten dollars, but you know, I, yeah, <laughs> this I is true. The, the the sales tax or or transfer yeah. fee or, or something like that, depending on your state laws. Yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah, so YNH says uh, no sales tax, no paperwork, and that's another part of it too. But it is linked to somebody. I mean, that's one thing you got to remember. And if you do sell, you know, if you do sell, it's always a good idea to know who you're selling it to, or if you can write their name down or see some ID. Obviously, you need to be checking and whatever you got to check. And if you don't have to do it in your state, that's fine. But it's always nice to have a record just in case it would come back on you. Somebody says, "Hey, this gun showed up in a crime. You know, who who who'd you sell it to? You know, what happened?" And uh, again, that's something you really got to take into consideration because it can be traced back to you at one point or another. So, okay, so yeah, 22 revolvers, you know, lockup is a big one. Timing is going to be a big one. And, I mean, the timing, you, you, I mean, that might be a little hard to tell in the store, especially if you don't get a chance to shoot it. But unless it's like a collectible, I'm thinking like a, well, like a Ruger Single Six or something, a lot of your other lower costs, like a Ruger Wrangler or a Heritage Rough Rider, you're almost better off just getting it new. Especially, you know, you're going to be the one that gets to break it in and, you know, it's not going to be abused and stuff. And, you know, it's going to have a warranty on it. So that can be a big deal, especially on such a cheap gun. To me, anything under 200 bucks is basically a cheap handgun, in my in my in my opinion, you know, revolver and so on. Um, so let's move into larger frame revolvers, full size revolvers, you know, 38 special, 357 mag, 44 mag. We've got lockup. We talk about timing. Are there any certain models you guys have ever been burned on? Or is there any models that are prone to have like a frame crack issue that you know of? Anything that really pops up initially? Uh the only thing I look for is if the um, firing pins actually on the um, hammer itself instead of a transfer bar. I'll look to see what, um, like, if that's been bent or pitted or anything like that, mm-hmm. because that is what sends everything, you know, sends everything home. On those Smith and Wesson Model 10s, a lot of people have a problem with uh, dry firing. It break those mm-hmm. firing pins. They're replaceable, but they're mounted in the hammer. Uh, they used to be one of my uh, units, uh, carry guns, you know, other than the AR-15. So is, is it a gunsmith job is what you're saying? Is it just a roll pin that keeps it in place? Or are you better off taking it to a gunsmith and getting it done or sending it into Smith or what? What do you think a person oh, should do with it? It's pretty easy. Yeah. You know, it's a roll yeah. pin. They just drive that pin out, put a new... Uh, 
put a new pin, uh, firing pin in the hammer, and then put that roll pin back in there. But you got to watch yourself. You know, be careful about not losing that little roll pin. Well, I mean, yeah, if kinda... it's the roll pin, you can get roll pins other places, but you got to have measurements and stuff like that first. Yeah. If you do go use just kind of a little side note, because sometimes we see, you know, police training revolvers that pop up, pop up from time to time. Like I know they had some Australian revolvers that popped up on Australian police department revolvers that popped up like on classic firearms or one of the Atlanta firearms, one of those companies. And, you know, the thing with those, man, it's going to be a crapshoot. If you don't get to see it in person, you might get it. It might be totally worn out, might have been beat to heck. It's like, oh, it's a police trade and it's just been a carry gun. It's only had 50 rounds a year put through it. Or it could have been like a, like a training gun <laughs> and it got used a lot. So you really want to watch out when I read the reviews on these things or like some of the plastics have been scuffed up or scratched heavily from daily use, you know, so kind of know what you're getting yourself into. I mean, it might almost be a better deal just to buy new versus used. Say you're looking at an M&P and they want $349 for it, you know, for a hundred bucks more, you get a brand new one. Well, I can get this one for $349. Okay, you get it. It's all beat to heck. The rifling in the barrel is not very good. You only get one mag with it. No back straps, you know, no manual, none of that crap. We well, could have just got it for hundred bucks more and had a brand new one. And maybe it's gonna, maybe just, maybe it'll shoot good. You know, faded night sights. When I know a lot of you guys don't care about night sights, but I'm just saying that like you might get it thinking, oh, it's it's only two ninety nine or three forty nine. So you really want to be careful when you go that route. See, on the revolvers, I don't know much about. I'm I'm kind of a revolver noob. I mean, if I did go with the revolver, it would probably be a Smith and Wesson or a Ruger, just because of, uh, you know, factory repairs would be covered under warranty. So that's a big one um unless you did something to the gun although we've tony's been on here before tony york's been on here before talking about one of his ruder models that he accidentally either double charged or overcharged around and broke the frame on the gun and ended up sending it into ruger and they replaced the frame no That's cost the, uh, the cylinder yeah the he cylinder it was a frame. cylinder okay cylinder right. cracked him if it was a framer it was a discussion from four years ago so i don't yeah. remember it but right. but still i mean that shows you that the company stands by their product now you might buy yourself like a like a charter arms bulldog or something and you might not have that good of an experience it might be a cheap revolver um i think taurus taurus revolvers are lifetime warranty on those also regardless of owner uh which is good i mean they don't want unsafe guns being circulated out there especially as much as they sell as many guns as they do sell um again yeah for you know for uh, for prices and stuff a lot of times like squib was saying a lot of times they want basically almost a new price for a used gun that's the only bad thing about me we Cash can be very persuasive at getting people to drop their price on a gun, but they'll ask the same price as new. And it's like, well, maybe I'll buy it because it's been hardly fired. And I will save on sales tax. I will save on shipping. I will save on a transfer fee if I can't get it locally. So it might be worth considering. I've, um, I've run into that problem uh, looking around for an older Model 29. I'd like to have an older one, one about as old as me. And at the gun shows, I see him for about $1,200. Oof. If you go to Smith and Wesson, their classic line, they've got their their classic version of the twenty nine with the wood grips and everything, and brand new, it's twelve hundred dollars. So you go, <laughs> why would you want to get the old? You know, the new one. The old one uh, is made differently. There's some different features about it. There's different models. You got to know what you're looking for, and even then, you you run the risk that somebody's messed with this thing. Because I have seen some that have been bubbled, and I'm like, how could you do this to such a beautiful revolver? Mm -hmm. But other ones, you know, they they've only shot it a few times. It hurts their wrist, and they're getting rid of it, or it's been sitting in the closet forever, or it was Grandpa's gun that he shot twice, and you know, I'm. And, and somebody got rid of it. So they end up in the market, you know, uh, if it's a Magnum uh, revolver, but somebody will go out there and they'll go buy that big bore revolver thinking, you know, now I'm a real man and they'll shoot it, cry like a little girl and go back to the store and, and lose money on it. And that store is gonna, gonna mark it up. If they're, if they're willing to sell something and it doesn't look that worn out, it looks like somebody only shot it a few times and realized that it was more than they could handle. If, if there's a deal on it, I'll pick it up, but they've got to have a deal on it. If, if it's like you were saying, only a hundred dollars less than the new one, I, you got to throw me a bone here, people. You know? It's cool. We've talked about this before. You and I have gone to gun shows and we see the same guys every year at these gun shows with the same guns and they're asking the same prices yes. and they won't budge. It's yeah. like, how do you even make any money to justify coming to these shows? It's like, okay, this is the fourth year in a row now i've offered you 25 dollars less on this bursa thunder combat that nobody else wants and you won't go down 25 dollars. i've got cash and you don't care and that's so, the show that we go to these guys go on a circuit 
So they're unloading and loading that trailer every weekend, every other weekend, yeah. once a month. And they've been doing this times four years. And maybe that's the answer. Maybe because they're trying to justify their expense of getting the gun to you. They don't want to back down on the price, you know? Well, th that are, you know, I know at Watermaker, it is a it's a thing like people have prices just to, you know, you know that the gun's way overpriced. They're there just to say, hey, I have this. There are some people that use those gun shows as bragging and you go talk to them and they will tell you absolutely everything about it. You could tell that they're a fanboy of it and they're, they're there just to um, show off what they have. Well, going yeah. back to that model 29, I was at a show a few years ago and at the front of the show, there was a guy with a used one in the case and it was the style I wanted. And then in the back of the show, there was a guy with a used one in a case same style I wanted, you know, barrel length finish, blah, 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 blah. And in between, there was somebody with uh, uh, another 44 that was very similar, but it was a different brand. It's a company that went out of business. Mm -hmm. And that one in the middle was a couple hundred dollars less, and they were all in about the same condition. Well, I talked to the guy in the back, and I said, hey, there's a guy up there who's got one. And he goes, yeah, I know. I go, he wants the same price. Will you come down on this? Uh, so, you know, I'll buy it from you. If it, and he goes, no, I won't budge. So I went to the guy in the front and I told him the same thing. And he goes, nope, I won't budge. And I know that some of these guys know each other. They talk to each other. They buy from each other and resell yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. So they may have a gentleman's agreement that, you know, we're not, but you know, and I understand they have to make some money. Otherwise, what are they doing there? How, how are they important to pay for their FFL? And like I said, move it, transporting it in the trailer every weekend and stuff like that. And what's funny is, I'll go into the store for this place and that gun will be so much money. And then I'll see that gun a month later at the gun show and they jack it up to $300. <laughs> because, be, well, at gun shows, a lot of the sales are a impulse buy. You're going by, oh, yeah. that's cool gun. Oh, it's that. And you don't, and people don't do research and they don't realize that, hey, this gun at the gun show is $200 more than if you go to and buy it yourself. And but I see I a, lot of, a lot of new gun owners maybe making that mistake because they see a gun they like, they don't even bother looking online. They don't go to gun dot deals. They don't go to gun broker to see what the, what the, what the, what the average market price is on it. And they buy it. And maybe that's how those tables make their money. So I uh, there's, there's that. And on top of that too, for coming from someone who's worked in sales and done a lot of trade shows, some of those shows it's expensive to have that floor space and have that table space at the show. So they're trying to recoup their cost. It, it is expensive to do that. And it is their weekend and stuff like that. But when you can, you could literally sell everything you brought in that weekend, as opposed to letting it gather dust in the store yeah. for months. I remember back in the eighties and nineties, I would go to these gun shows and everything costs less than in the store. You, you know, once again, this FFL brings all their stuff or brings, it brings some of the stuff they haven't been able to sell. And they sell it at a lower price, or the sort of that they, the things that they hide behind the counter are suddenly on the table at the gun show, and you know you could go to their store and it's more money at the store and less money at the show. And then somewhere in the late '90s, early 2000s, somewhere in there, it started to flip in my area. And by by 2010, you were starting to see you know where you paid more at the show and less at the shop. And I go, where was the logic in this? If it worked before, why is it? So, you know, I guess the impulse buy thing and all that other stuff. But, yeah, it's it's interesting how some of these guys aren't willing to budge. And they don't understand that not everybody is going there on an impulse buy. Some people are going there because they can look for everything under one roof. And other people are going there for a deal. And if you don't want to work out a deal, then you're not going to make a sale. And, I, and you know what? I, it's kind of like the attitude they had, they had at the Harley dealer. Hey, man, somebody will buy this. So we're not budging on the price. You know? mm -hmm. That and, and uh, you know, especially nowadays, let's say you, you know, right now, or let's say a year ago, you go to a gun, gun store, you know, FL takes all of the stuff there. Let's say he does price everything to sell and they sell everything. They t go back to the shop and go, well, we're not able to get a gun. So we're going to have to close because they sold everything at the gun show, gun, gun, uh, gun show. And then to add the icing on the cake, New York Outcast kind of sums it up. And you pay for parking and you pay to get in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, God, I know they just get you. You, you might be yeah, better off just. 
Yeah, some yeah. of these shows we've been to, they cost us sixteen hundred dollars or more to have for the booth for the weekend. So you gotta be they're just trying to recoup their cost and they think they got a you know captive audience, which they a lot of times they overestimate it. So yeah, they're charging too much. Yeah, but it's yeah. also a tax write off. Don't let them fool you. Now, as far as the paying to get in, I like going to the antique arm show that they do four times a year here because uh, you can get into the show for free if you uh, renew your NRA membership for another year. And I do it one, two, three years at a time. I know there's people that don't like the NRA. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Go get bent. But uh, they'll pay my, my entrance to the show. And it's something where I'm going to forget to renew this anyhow. And they'll just, you know, I'll renew it you know, three, six months in advance. And, and it'll just overlap. Right, they'll just apply it to my balance so I don't forget about it. So I kill two birds with one stone. I don't let my membership lapse and I get free entry into the show. But yeah, if you're paying, if you're paying to drive out there and fuel and you're paying to park and you're paying to get into the show, at that point, it's like, well, I'm here. I might as well buy something. But I've walked out of shows uh, empty handed because either the, the price wasn't right or they just didn't have the selection. There have been shows that I've been impressed with and shows I've been disappointed with. Mm -hmm. So for for me, whenever I go to a gun show, I don't look at at it as a hey, I'm gonna find a deal. It's kind of like hey, I'm going to a movie and or something. It's it's something to do that day to look at all the firearms and stuff like that, and you know, be able to touch and feel them and stuff like that. Uh, versus just going to a gun show, a gun uh, a gun store and seeing all the just new guns or having, you know, only two or three in the used area or, you know, but basically it's, it's more of a, Hey, there's a lot of this older stuff that I may have never seen. Mm -hmm. Let's go look at them. Two gun kitty. The cat of outlaw says I bought a private sale Ruger GP 100, 357 at a gun show for $550. That is awesome. Was never fired. Sticker on the box was 850. He was trying to trade with dealers. So offered little over dealers with cash. So you can, there are some good deals out there if you really do look around and do some research, but, uh, you it, know, it, really, yeah. It's going to be half, it's going to have to come from private because guns, if it comes from mm -hmm. FL or someone that's like has a table, they, they know what they can get for it. But if it's a private seller coming in, they're like, well, if, uh, if I trade this, it'll be, I'll get $300. They'll t turn around and sell it for 500. Will someone buy it for 400? So it's mm -hmm. a win-win cutting out the middle man. And again, I, I, you know, I don't want to make this a gun show discussion, but it is very important to mention this because that's going to be one of the places where you're going to find a good chunk of your used guns that you can legally purchase in some states, you know. And then also, like I said, the used cases too. So you really got to kind of know the prices and what it is new. And then, like I said before, you know, check and see what comes with it. Do you get all the magazines? Do you not? Accessories? Do you get them? Do you not? Um, parts availability. Again, you might buy a, a neat gun you've always liked, uh, you know, used, but it might be a rare model and magazine availability might be limited. There might be nothing out there at all. So you really got to kind of do some research. And, and again, impulse purchases happen. We've all done them before and kind of know, you know, what you get yourself into. All right. So what about, uh, let's go. Okay. We've had a little chat on the, on the revolvers, you know, things to look for and stuff. Um, use semi-automatics, um, things that I look for personally, I'll take the slide off, look down the barrel, look for wear on the top of the, of the barrel. Uh, also check the inside of the slide, see if there's anything broken inside the gun, especially if it's a polymer lower. Um, you know, just wear and tear. Does it look like it's been fired a lot? Look for wear on the back of the hammer. These are all things that you can research when you when you get the pistol. Now, when you get into mill strips, that's a whole different kind of thing because there could be special, unique issues the gun has, or there might be lots of wear that's considered normal. Now, you could just you know be like Squib and just don't buy polymer guns at all. Therefore, you don't have to worry about that that wear and tear on the polymer itself. So yep. uh, just keep that in mind. So yeah, if you're looking at, you know, if you're looking at a used semi-auto, especially if you're going to do like a Glock or an M&P, it looks like it's had some use. Like I said before, think about replacing the, uh, with. I would recommend factory parts, factory weights on the springs and stuff, you know, unless you're going to modify it for whatever reason, um, you know, recoil springs and so on. Important to check those things. Uh, and again, accessory, accessories that come along with it. But yeah, I'm more likely for me, you know, used to, to buy, uh, like all metal guns or try to find a really good deal on something if I can. I think that definitely, definitely helps out a lot. If I um, ever do buy a Glock, just to have a Glock more or less, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've said it before and I'm, I'll probably end up doing it just to have one, right? Yeah, same. My thing is uh, I would like to save some money on it because it's not really going to be a very important gun to me to have and all that. And, and I would like to get a used one, but I just, I, 
I don't want somebody to think that, yo, oh, it's a Glock, so you're going to pay, you know, almost new price. That's one thing. I've got to get a deal on this thing. The other thing is all this Gen 1, Gen 5, Gen, I can't stand that Gen garbage. Okay. It's <laughs> either Series 70 or Series 80 or it's nothing. Okay. I don't understand this whole, this magazine doesn't fit this one and this doesn't fit that. Well, why? If it's Glock perfection, why do you got to, why do you got to make it? Why you got to mess up a good thing? Why don't well, you just leave it? It's you know, spin. We, you know, you and I come from the car world. No different than cars. You're going to do certain, certain production runs. They're going to change things. Like that's different. I, it's it's practically a different model. They just slap the name on there. Okay, if it's a Glock 17 and it's a Glock 17, if it was made in 1985 or is made in 2020, it should be. If there's their Glock I, Glock 17s. I can understand if there's a 17L and uh, uh, you know, or, or or the 19 doesn't fit the 17 or something like that, but. No, the, 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 there's been like auto parts, like oh, in, in like in the mid '80s, uh, let's say an '86 something, beginning of the year, they had that uh, certain type of part, and they changed it mid production run. St still an '86, yeah. whatever. Yes, but it's it's not the same. I'm telling you, as as, a, as somebody who makes this crap in a factory, it's not the same. You it guys, not the same in a firearm. At, it, you guys look at it from a consumer standpoint, but it's literally a different model. You, and, and, and it might be called by that, but it's literally a different model. So don't call it a Glock 17 Gen 5. Call it a Glock 170. Okay. Well, it, it's a Gen <laughs> like, like 5. BMWs it's or a something different that... model. Yeah. Glock, it's a different oh, model. See, I don't exactly want to go. The same. All Glocks are exactly the same. Having this discussion, piss, pissing back and forth about changing, like Squib is right. You change uh, uh, one magazine release and now it's a new Gen all Glocks are exactly the same. And that's not me knocking on Glocks. That's just the bare honest truth. Yeah, but my thing is if I'm going to buy a used one and then suddenly I can't get parts for it because it's an older gen, or I go to buy mags for this thing and they don't fit because I've got uh, Gen 3 and I bought Gen 5 mags. What the heck? I, mean, I don't have that problem with a 1911. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's been some significant design changes between Gen 3 and Gen 4. Like your force had reduced finger grooves. They added the back straps. Uh, there might have been in interior. There might have been a few parts they've, they've changed inside. But I do agree with you, Squib. But I mean, to me, like the 3, 4, and 5, there's some significant design differences between them. Now, I see less of a difference between the 4 and the 5. But I mean, there's even more changes between the 4 and the 5. They've added an ambi slide release. They've I don't know about the mags. They've changed the coating. They've changed the barrel slightly. Um, they've got different back straps. So, I mean, I don't know. I guess the gen thing doesn't bother me. But again, I'm looking at it as a, as a consumer, and you do make a pretty good point. Why can't I just be compatible across the board? Or two, going from gen two to gen three, adding an accessory rail, right? I mean, it almost kind of feels like you're kind of getting iPhoned to death where the new iPhone comes out and you just yes. get like a slightly better camera and maybe a little bit brighter screen. Hey, it's $100 more than it was before, you know? So, so I think you get that. But you see that with other models. You see that with M&Ps. You know, you see well, that with blocks anyhow. M and P is just another Glock. But, <laughs> but hey, you see, they're all Glocks. He's, to me, he's also the I Shadow One, buy, the Shadow Two. You know, I don't so, want to buy a used Glock in order to justify me spending money on a Glock. And the guy goes, "I've had this thing since 1989, and it it's in still in good shape because I haven't shot it a lot." And then I try to go get parts for it because Glock perfection, right? And we don't make those anymore because it's a Gen One, Two. I don't know. Do you see what I mean? As a consumer, yeah. as yes. somebody who's not yes. a Glock tard, I don't. That that's that's kind of a, a put off for me to want to even buy one of these things. You yeah. Well, well I mean, save yourself the trouble. Yeah. Buy yourself a PSA dagger. It's what a Glock should cost new in the first place. Uh, no, and all the parts are interchangeable. No, no. <laughs> and there's a ton of Gen three parts out there, and there's a ton of Gen four parts. I would say your Gen one, Gen two Glocks, you're definitely going to start to have some issues finding replacement parts, especially if you have a frame crack or you have something major that goes out. You you might not be able to source those parts. You know. Uh, YNH has a good point. I disagree with that. Parts get improved and lose compatibility. So because of reliability issues or maybe design, design changes to enhance the feel of the gun, say the trigger, or maybe to ensure reliability, they put a larger extractor on it. So yeah, like little, little, I, I'm, I'm glad that when Glock makes the changes, it's like, it comes out with every generation. They don't necessarily make those changes in real time because then you could have problems. Like you buy it and you go buy an extractor for it and you realize you've got the wrong one, even though it's a gen three. Wait a minute, they change the extractors halfway through the production run? How the heck am I supposed to know that? So that, that's not the case. So that's why with the gens, you get that definite set of changes. So you know what you're buying yourself into, or you know what the compatibility is going to be. But for the consumer, it makes it easier. Do I need a Gen 3 backstrap or a Gen 4? 
a Gen 5. Well, knowing the Gen number, the generation number, makes it easier from the consumer standpoint to get what you need for it. So, but Squib, I do agree. I mean, I and do as agree. A mil- yeah. I, well, as a million. Mil- oh, go ahead. I don't have any, any Glocks, but the thing that I could see, and you guys are kind of enlightening at this somewhat, with all this... Uh, all this part interchangeability, you know, if you've got a Glock 42, 9 millimeter, then the magazine should be marked Glock 42, 9 millimeter. You know, marking those parts would make it a whole lot easier to uh, for people to figure out, well, is this going to fit my gun? Well, you look at the side of the magazine, stamped right on it. If you've got a Glock 42, 9 millimeter, there you go. Just, well, just the, a simple with, bunch of marking. And I, I don't know if the Gen 5 and Gen 4 mags are compatible between the Glocks. I should know that. I'm actually looking at getting a Gen a Gen 5 G17 anyway. I'm interested in one because I miss not having my Gen 4 G17 around. I still want to buy another Gen 4. But the whole magazine thing, Squib, what you're talking about, a lot of that's happening now because Glock has gone to new frame sizes, new models. So, you know, they've got some single stacks and they've got some one and a half stacks and they've got some double stacks. And they've got some different... You know they're just they're they're just offering a bunch of different models now so yeah you're right i mean like why can't that one mag just work in everything but it's because they've also changed their design and their their frame sizes and their 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 handle links so that does make a bunch of unique only to this model magazines and parts that you're going to run into and they've definitely in the last five years exploded in the different varieties and flavors that they offer you know although they all feel about the same they're very unique and different so as a reluctant consumer mm-hmm. they made it difficult for me to want to purchase their product. And if I'm going to, it's probably going to be used to save money. I just don't want to get a used one and then come to find out I've got no product support. This is a current production gun. I don't, I, 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 yeah. I don't know how to explain. Somebody can go, well, the F-150 is a current production truck. So why can't I get every single part for my 1985 F-150? They're two different trucks. But you put a Glock 17 Gen 1 and a Glock 17 Gen 5 next to me, they're the same gun to me. Okay. okay I, I understand that. But I mean, mechanically and design wise, they're not. They're very yes, different guns. They're the same. There's gonna be there's gonna be parts you can interchange, but there's gonna be parts you can't. But so I think it's just more the outside appearance of it, but under the hood, things are gonna be a lot different. But as a, well, 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 they don't do that with cars. It's literally everything is different. Okay, seriously. Yeah. But okay, yeah. now but with as a Milsurp guy. You might go, well, don't you have trouble sourcing certain parts or aren't you looking for a rare version of this or that or the other? Yes, but that is research and that is that is the, the hunt for this and the search for that. And that's the challenge and that's part of the fun of being into mill serps. Mm-hmm. Glocks aren't mill serps to me. They're not. You could say, well, this is a surplus Austrian army handgun or something it's not a mil- because it's a current production gun per se i don't look at a 19 my sr 1911 as a mill surf okay it's a it's a current production 1911 it's not it's not like this thing actually came back from world war one not a colt from 1911 yeah. you and know even then a new yeah. production cold is not a mill surf to me so when i'm looking yeah. at mill surf it can be a challenge finding this stuff but that's part of the fun of it with uh, a daily carry or a range toy or something like that i guess it's i just look at it differently it's a different perspective for me but at some point uh yeah i'll probably get one and i'll get one used i just hope i don't get burned yeah so jamie's got a question okay guys i have a question what sort of things would you check for in buying a used pistol i hope we've been covering that kind of criteria i know we've been kind of sidetracking a little bit with our little our little pissing contest but that just happens from time to time uh should i take someone with you know it's not a bad idea to take somebody with you that might be a firearms enthusiast, but you could maybe be that person might be biased towards one brand or another instead of what's best for you. Um, I would say, you know, do your own research on the model, look up maybe reliability, common issues with that gun, magazine availability, warranty before you go buy it. Uh, it's okay to take somebody with you who's going to help you know what to look for. But again, when you take off the slide or you're looking at the revolver, listen to what we've what we've been talking about, you know, revolver lockup and timing, issues you could have with it, uh, excessive wear and tear. A lot of sloppy play in the slide and so on. Things like that are things you can look for. Cracked frame, worn out interior, you know, parts inside. There might be some, something broken inside of it, like Defense Dad with that SR-45 that he had gotten with a broken guide rod. You know, definitely just ask that gun store to take it apart and ask them if they stand behind their purchases. What is there any kind of a return on it whatsoever if you have issues with it when you take it out to the range? Because that's the other thing. A lot of people unload guns because they have problems with them. Like Rokal 219 did one on the Canic TP9SF. 
you know, gun that sees military service in Turkey. I want one. I think they're pretty cool, right? And we're, whether or not it's Turkish manufacturer, let's not have that argument right now. But then he takes it to the range and it has nothing but problems. First of all, he gets it. It looks like it's never been cleaned before. Things just caked and just crud filled. He cleans it, takes it to the range. It doesn't run worth a darn. He tries all kinds of different ammo in it. I think he even changed the recoil spring and the guide rod. Still has trouble with it. It's like, okay, somebody obviously dumped this because they knew it had some problems. So when you're buying used, there's always a possibility you're buying someone else's problem, just like a used car. Oh, now it runs great. And you go 10 blocks down the road, the transmission blows up. And, and you know, they poured something down the transmission just to keep it going long enough to get it out of their driveway. And now it's your problem. So there are lemons out there and you're going to get burned and that's going to happen. I mean, that luckily for me, that's never happened. But half the guns I bought, I bought from Defense Dad. But I bought and used out of the used case and not had any problems. But I've always done a good inspection on the gun before I buy it. And also when I got it, I said to myself, OK, if this needs a firing pin, I can do the replacement. OK, if this needs a recoil spring, you know, I can do the replacement. So little things like that. It's not a bad idea, but you might want to let that gun friend that you're taking with you know that you're interested in a lot of different models and you go with what feels most comfortable in your hands. And if you can shoot it ahead of time or rent one like it ahead of time, I suggest suggest you do. It's better to drop 50 bucks now than spend 550 and regret it. So that's something to take into consideration. Uh, we got a little <laughs> M&P comparison going on between Squib Load and uh, New York Outcast out there. So yeah, I mean, it's okay to take somebody with you, but understand that that gun person might be biased towards one particular brand and that might be more than what your budget allows, or they might be trying because they're an enthusiast or pushing for you to get a particular model. So that's something you want to watch out for. Um, and again, that's just it. I mean, definitely just do an inspection on it if you can, before you take it home price, know the price you're getting into, know if there's going to be any major, you know, are you really saving money? Or are you not? If you do have to pay tax on it or a transfer fee, you do have to buy those accessories and those mags. Are you still saving anything in the end? And we're not trying to persuade anybody to not buy used guns, but there's a few things you should keep in mind. And maybe this is more of a, a chat for a first time gun owner or a new gun owner. I'm just saying that I'm looking in the use case now and there's a lot of really good deals out there because people are trading those guns and they bought during pandemic riot era in our history. And those guns are showing up and they're in really good shape. A lot of XDs, a lot of Springfield XDs. The majority are XDs and Kimbers. It's yeah. kind of odd. That's like 70% of the case at Shields. But Here, here's one thing too is, you know, you kind of talked about know the prices because I don't know about you, but if it's, if I'm only saving $50 compared to buying brand new, then I'm going to buy the brand new. But yeah, like for example, yeah. Everybody, most everyone knows I love my HKs. My main carry gun most of the year is an HK BP9. I bought that. It looked like it had been unfired. I bought that for four ninety nine when that gun goes for seven eight hundred dollars. Um, so that was a good deal. But if you're only saving fifty or a hundred bucks, then weigh the options. Is it worth it buying, spending a little bit more and buying brand new? <clears throat> No, man, I agree. I agree with you. It's just you kind of got it. And Jamie says, you know, well, I am a first time gun owner. So, no, that's why we're going all these details. And we're just saying that even guys like us make mistakes or do impulse purchases. And even we get burned from time to time. And we're not trying to, you know, try to, sure, you know, steer you away from buying a, a gun at all or even buying that used gun that you want. But if you're looking at the use case, it is good to consider, but just know what you're doing. If you can get something, it's in good shape and you can save 50 bucks and everything comes with it. And you know, you got a warranty. Man, by all means, go ahead and buy it. But you definitely want to hunt around. Check prices, though, too, because you never know. Stores can have different prices or stores will price match online. So that's something else you have to watch for when you go to make the purchase. Yeah. If it's fine. Been, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, if it's been out of production for a long time or it's a mill cert, expect some wear. Expect that you might have to do some repair work on it. If it's something you want that bad, you've got to have this for your collection or you've always wanted one of these or you, you, you managed to shoot one that somebody had and they weren't willing to part with it and you come across it and now you want one yourself and you're willing to pay a gunsmith to work on it or you're willing to you know re-blue it or whatever it is right if you're willing to do that then getting something that's worn out is acceptable if you if you understand going into it that i'm buying this as an investment or i'm buying this to to maybe this is this is the cheap gun that i'm gonna i don't care if i break it because i'm i'm learning how to fix a gun on this or something because mm -hmm. lots of people have bought an inexpensive gun and made mistakes with it not caring because they're, they don't you know they didn't pay a lot for it but if you're getting um that gun and it's going to be it's it's just a gun it's not i've been looking for this you know, yeah, I want to try this out, or this is a new thing, or or I I want a carry gun, or a range toy, or a hunting gun, or something like that. 
and, and you're really not sure what you want, maybe you know the caliber or roughly the barrel length or something, but you really don't know what you want, then there's lots of used guns out there that are barely, barely used, not just because of what happened in the past two years, but lots of people will buy a gun, you know, put uh, less than 50 rounds through it, throw it in the closet, and it sits there for decades. So you should be able to tell that just by looking at some of it. But if it looks yeah. like somebody, you know, kind of uh, at past uh, reblued it or something, you should be able to tell just, or they spray painted or something. I mean, just if, if you don't have good eyesight, bring your reading glasses out, you know, but I mean, there's, there's just things to look for like, like rust or, or if they rattle candid or something like that. This is, I, I don't think it'd be that hard to spot. But and also yeah. the price could be something. Why are you selling it so cheap or why are you selling it so high? And just use some of your consumer common sense as if you were buying another product. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. Uh, see, Eduardo Espinosa says, did Springfield make another bad PR move? Uh, yeah, they started selling the Hellion. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. <laughs> which has been a, hey, it's been a success for them. Although it's, it's you know, it's ridiculous what people are asking for these things. Everything's over MSRP anymore. Cars, guns, my reputation, it's its ridiculous. Anyway, what happened with Springfield um, during the pandemic, and this is what I noticed, like in the height of the pandemic, when all these sales were up, Springfield started offering the three bonus, like three free mags and like a holster or whatever free with any XD purchase. And I think maybe that was a hook, line and sinker for a lot of people. That's why a lot of people bought XDs or at the height of, of the pandemic, that might've been one of the last models that was available handgun wise. And then people just snagged them up or the Kimbers because, you know, a lot of experience, I mean, I'm not going to say anything about XD or Kimber, but I'm just saying that, you know, maybe you tend to see more of those around than Glocks or Smith and Wesson or Skies or Taurus, you know, there's all these different reasons why, but I really think that maybe uh, Springfield's promotion thing was one of the reasons why a lot of people snagged them just because they were throwing in $75 with the mags and a holster. And I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just, I just noticed a lot of people buying them at that point. So that could have been it, but I don't know why. It just seems to be a lot of XDs that are showing up in the cases right now. And maybe that's just a shields thing. Maybe they just buy these in batches. I have no idea. So uh, let's see, Jamie Clapp. If you, where did you say you're at, Jamie? I can't remember. Can you give us an idea? I said DFW. I'll be down in the Dallas Fort Worth area this summer. So, Jamie, I recommend the Bullet Trap. It's a really good range in the Dallas area. They've got a lot of used guns that you can go check out and try. And then from there, maybe try to search out and find one of those guns used, and then you can buy one. Uh, also, Jamie, go to Shields down in the, I think it's in, oh, you said Galveston. Okay, you're a ways away. Um, yeah, if we know anybody in the Galveston area that's a YouTuber, maybe we can just let you guys connect or something and meet at a gun store or go to a range or something. I mean, a lot of us just like to go out and shoot anyway. If you're in Nebraska, man, we'd be happy to take you there. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Eduardo Espinosa says Kimbers were really bad the last time I've seen them too. Again, do your research. I mean, it, it's going to be hit or miss Tuesday nights at nine o'clock when it comes to a lot of these guns. Also, some guns could have a break in period. I noticed with my Rock Island Armory 1911 that I bought way back in the day, my GI model, it said you could be looking at anywhere between three to 500 rounds for this gun to function 100%. It even said that in the manual. There may be a break in period because of the tight tolerances and the fact there's just so much metal under the hood essentially that needs to wear and tear and mesh before it's going to be as reliable as possible so that's always a possibility i mean that's something you could run into also yeah jamie says south of houston i know where i know where galveston is dfw in dallas is unfortunately about 12 hours away but we'll see what we can do for you man also jamie clap again not to toot my own horn but if you just go into the search box and youtube and type in caliber corner space and then just type in any topic you're interested in there's a pretty good chance we've done an episode on it at one point or another you know reloading new guns mill surf guns Glocks, m &Ps. If you do a search, you'll probably find an episode of what we've talked about. The information is going to be relevant, even though the episodes could be four or five years old. Um, I, I've done, we've done a lot. We've done 232 shows. We've covered a variety of topics. And sometimes there's some repeats with some updates, which is like today's episode. And then sometimes it's a whole new topic. So I'm just saying there's a lot of content for you that want to watch them. But all right. Well, guys, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Unless anybody else wants to say anything else about just buying used guns, you know, giving you some ideas what to look for extra expenses, things to check. You know, it is a lot like buying a used car. Unfortunately, you never know what you're going to get till you get it home necessarily. But um, uh, single shot, anything you want to say about buying used? Should, should people stay away from it? Or are they are they okay with it? What do you think? Well, you know, it's common sense, you know, take a good look yeah. at it and see what condition it's in generally. Uh, if it's been taken care of, then... Uh -huh. You know, that kind of stuff there goes along with just 
general maintenance, you know, yeah. if it's a rush bucket, you know, buyer beware, you know, you, you're not going to be able to, uh, to do a whole lot with it, you know. Mm -hmm. if, if I've got some external rust on it, the bore is good. Uh, I'll put it on the bench, put it across the carding wheel, take that rust off, and then conserve it. You know, after uh, after I get things done, I'll do a test fire on it, see how she's doing. That's what I did with that Dan Wesson that's in that uh, last video I did on YouTube. On, um, not YouTube, Rumble. You know, that was one of the survivors. And uh, I went through it, checked things all out. I had to make a couple minor repairs, replaced a few parts. But uh, other than that, the old girl is... A thundering revolver again, so. Yeah, you know, maybe you want to get something to tinker with and you're okay doing some minor gunsmithing work yourself, you're okay with, or you want to put some money, maybe get some, get something refurbished or get some re-bluing done on it or whatever. I mean, you know, and there's nothing wrong with buying one just to play wrong, just to play along oh, with yeah. like a gunsmith special or whatever, if you just want to learn or attempt to fix it, you know, so, or it could turn into a total nightmare, you know, you never know, yeah. so I don't know. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, Squib, yep. anything you want to say about experience. buying Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, Squid, anything you want to say about buying used guns? Anything we kind of missed or anything we overlooked or any any little yeah. final bits of advice? Yeah. Two things. I'll, I'll add on to what single do it. said. It is a learning experience. Sometimes you do get burned. Sometimes you end up with a lemon. Sometimes you've got something that you're going to sell or trade later because, you know, you thought you'd like it and you didn't or something else like that. But you also end up with more guns. And you never know what that will lead up to. If you buy some guns early on when you really don't know as much and you're, you're maybe making some mistakes uh, as far as your preferences, don't necessarily just unload them. Mm -hmm. Go away and save them because one day you could uh, have a significant other in your life that might like that gun or you can have little ones. I had uh, three SKS rifles. Uh, my first rifle was an SKS, or my first gun that I bought was an SKS, and then I bought two more after that, which is like make one mistake and then make two more. Um, <laughs> Except now they're thousand dollar mistakes, well, right? You know. <laughs> so I, I I got rid of them because I don't like yeah. them. I don't. Yeah. And, and um, now they're worth more money. Now at the time, what I what I got rid of them for it was I I I broke even. Okay. What what. Uh, I, I ended up saving money on something else at the time by, by getting rid of these things. But um, now that they're worth more money and both of my sons have said they sure would like an SKS rifle. I'm like, Dang, I had two brand new Norinkos in the box. Right? <laughs> I had two brand new Norinkos. I mean, when I took them to the, the, the gun store, the guy's like, uh, why do you have them? They're still in the box. I said, I bought them, you know, as an investment, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, because I, I had the used one and, and why not just run the, the crap out of that? And then when that one breaks, pitch it in the trash and pull a new one out of the box. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just don't know when that gun might be something that, uh, you know, a new gun friend is like, Oh, you've got one of those or just, you just don't know. So if you don't need the money, if you don't need the space, just hold on to it. I mean, you'll end up with five or six gun safes and it's not a bad thing uh, until you go to move. So um, the other thing uh, I want to point out, my opinion is I would buy a used gun over a used car every single day. With a used gun, okay. it's probably going to, to run better. It's probably going to last longer, and it's probably going to have more, more support as far as finding parts or the warranty or anything else like that. Used cars are you're buying somebody else's problem. With a used gun... You could be buying somebody else's problem, but it's probably going to be an easier or less expensive fix, a longer lasting fix. Um, yeah. But with a, uh, a used car, you might look at it on the outside and it looks OK, but on the inside, it isn't. With a used gun, you can tell just on the outside. I mean, a lot of times I, in doing things like cycling it or, or something like that, just checking out a few things on it. With a car, yeah, you can test drive it up to a certain point, but... I just, in my experience, used guns are a much better investment. Used car, you're throwing your money in the fireplace. So, so Squib, I don't want to, I know you had your truck that you sold, you used your Dodge and stuff, and I'm not, I'm not ripping on you, but I see how people drive their cars and I don't want to buy those problems later on. I see how people just, especially in big cities, man, it's just pedal to the metal. Just, I, I, yeah, the last two vehicles I bought now have, all, have both been new. I just want to make sure if I, if it's going to be broken, it's because of me. 
You know, I just, I've been burned too many times on. Yeah. The, the last used vehicle I bought was 10 years ago. It lasted me 10 years. And I still had to do a lot of work on it myself. My dad owns it now. And he only bought it because he knew that I did all the work on it. So I got, I got uh, 16 years, 17 years out of that Dodge. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last three to five years, I was sinking over $7,000 a year into the thing. Right. It was, a, it was a Dodge heavy duty for people I, that don't know. So yeah, I had a, diesel, yeah, I had a, it was a beast. Yeah. One yeah, ton yeah. diesel, off-road pack. I mean, this thing is, yeah, it'll it'll crash through any any barricade or you name it. I mean, this horde is, you might run into, you know? <laughs> it, it had everything. I actually had somebody at a stoplight motion me to roll down my window. And he goes, is that a manual transmission? I said, yeah. And he goes, how much do you want for it, right? Uh, this, this thing is, yeah, 10 ply tires and everything else. And um, <laughs> no, I should say it started it started with like, Twenty-eight hundred dollars, and then three thousand dollars, and five thousand, and fifty-five hundred, and then seven thousand, and and it, so I sold the thing uh, fairly inexpensively to a friend of mine, and he's already sank over three thousand dollars into it, and he's had it uh, a year, I think, uh, two years, two years now, mm -hmm. no, a year. He's had it a year, and he sank three, and that's with his son owns a shop, so they're buying all the parts at cost. Uh, one of the parts he had to replace still had a lifetime warranty. So I helped him use, I bought it. Right. So we got it under my warranty. So, so he's, he's had some, and some of the parts for this thing, he's waiting three months to get. So the thing's literally sitting in the shop, taken apart. There's a certain point where you make it somebody else's problem. And I let him know, Hey dude, you're, it's, 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 this truck is almost 20 years old. It's, he goes, I don't care. I want this truck, he, you know, because of some yeah. of the features on it, you can't yeah. get it anymore. You just yeah. can't. And and uh, and that, that's something to, to consider. But, yeah, there's a certain point where it's like, all right, it's going to be somebody else's problem. I really don't like selling something to a friend, but he was adamant. He wanted this thing. And I'm like, dude, don't come back at me later and say yeah. this ain't working. That ain't working or, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and, and that's another thing. When you buy a used gun off of a friend, um, you better make sure if you're selling it, you better make sure that that thing works. OK, because. They 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 make me coming to you every couple months going this broke and that broke and this doesn't work you know you, you, you need to state it at that time say look man we're we're fun, we're buddies but this is this is as is if it has a problem it's on you this is not going to put a strain on I don't want to lose friendship with you because of the because you because you can't get a recoil spring for your Gen One Glock seventeen you know? yes yes yep yep there you go so that's why that's, I'll never sell you a Gen One Glock anything squid <laughs> and that's why when somebody's on hard times and they're like hey man I, I need some cash I can't get a lot for this at the pawn shop or the gun store or whatever would you buy it for you know uh, a full price off of me uh, if it's something I'm looking for and I have the extra money I'll go ahead and do that but I always make that caveat if you ever want it back. I will sell it back to you for what I paid for it, plus a transfer fee or anything else like that. Now, if that's 10 years down the road and I put more wear and tear on it and you're like, no, nah, man, uh, I want it back, but you got to knock $100 off of it. All right. I yeah. told you in the beginning. And that's so, yeah, just like the same as is, you got to be very clear about that because there are some people that will come back at you again and again. And this isn't my problem anymore. I told you and you bought this thing. Yeah. Or you make a recommendation to somebody to get one and then they have problems with it later on. It's like, you know, you got to establish those things in a uh, a friendship early on. So I think that's important for a person to know. So you don't want that to strain your friendship. But uh, Patriot in the Dark says, have a good report with the guys at your local gun shop. If they notice something's wrong, then they'll turn you away from them. Also bring lots of donuts. So there you go. That's, yeah, just drop off a box of donuts and uh, make some friends at your local gun shop. Hang out a little bit. Get to know the person, you know. Um Defense Dad, anything you want to say about uh, buying used guns, man? I mean, have we not covered it? Did we miss anything at all, or, or not? Oh, I think we'll, I think we've covered it all. It's it's. I buy quite a few guns used. I buy quite a few new. Um, just know what you're getting into. Yeah, and I think in our last episode that we did, um, we we went on a gun broker and looked at used prices and stuff, and showed that you could get some really good deals. You know. So, yeah, there's just there's definitely a lot of good deals out there if you look around. All right, let's go and get our final plugs in. We're going to wrap this one up, and uh, I think we're going to have, have a good time. So, all right, single shot. Anything you want to say before we go? Well, I hope everybody has a good weekend, what's left of it, and uh, take care. God bless. And check out the new video on Rumble there that I dropped uh, the other day. Excuse my voice. I'm pretty right, hoarse you're, you're in over that so. hole. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, man. You're with us today, and that's good. Appreciate having you here. So awesome, man. Thanks and, for the uh, we'll invite. Be back Take on care. God no bless. Problem. America moves by truck.
Absolutely. All right, uh, Squib, any final words of wisdom? Any final plugs you want to get in there? Or are you good? I'm good if I can find the mute button. <laughs> Dude, I, don't worry about it. It's okay with us being live on these panels. People just, yeah. You know, we, we can only cover so much in a show. We've talked about this on other shows. I'd recommend going back through your playlist and stuff like that. We're not going to mm -hmm. answer all kinds of questions, but that, that's what the comment section is for. Mm -hmm. Use the comment section, ask questions, things like that, but you may not get the answer you want or you may not understand the answer. There's some things about getting into this, the, the gun culture, being more than just a gun owner, but getting into the gun culture where you learn by trial and error and sometimes that costs you money. As long as it's not legal fees, you're doing good. Absolutely, man. <laughs> Words to live by. Words of wisdom. All right. And uh, Defense Dad, any uh, final plugs? Uh, I got nothing. I got, right, a, I got a word of advice, though. What's that? When shooting 450 Bushmaster, don't have your stock at its fully collapsed position. Yes, yes. 450 Bushmaster, if you've never fired it before, it has a little more kick than a person realizes. And yeah. there's a possibility yeah. that, that uh, yeah. well, I'm, I'm saying the first time, if you're not paying attention, if yeah. you don't realize the potential of what you're shooting. Yeah. Look, let me, let me just throw it out there. Don't be ignorant like me and get too close to the stock when you pull the trigger. All right? I'm just going to throw it out there right now. Admit it. I wasn't thinking. I was thinking five, five, six recoil. It it box a little bit more than that. So just uh, you know, especially if you've got a scope with low eye relief or short eye relief on it, it make sure you've got a, a firm grasp on that firearm. You know, look, Squib. Not everybody's got your Sasquatch like strength. Okay, some of us are weak. So <laughs> well, they they used to tell us you might be dumb, but we'll make you strong. So there you go. There you go. Yep. Exactly. But yeah, no 450 Bushmaster. That's gonna be coming up on our channel. Here, Defense Dad and I did 450 Bushmaster range tests and 556 and Squib. We might have some brass for you. Lots and lots of brass for you in 450 uh, Bushmaster. So just to kind of give you a heads up, you make it. All right, I'll reload it. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys. So we're gonna go and let you go. Uh, thanks for watching. This has been Caliber Corner episode number 232. Just a little used gun chat. Get out there, look around, have some fun. Check out the prices. You know, cash still may be king when you're making purchases and and if not, like Squib says, just put it on your credit card. Or if you do, make sure you get some sort of member club points to justify it. So uh, anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching. This has been a great episode. And we'll see everybody on Thursday. What gun are we going to talk about on Thursday? I don't know. Maybe thinking that Rossi RS-22 slash Mossberg Blinkster. Maybe some cheap 22 LR uh, rifles. We haven't talked about one of those for a while. I've Share my experiences with that Rossi. That's a fun one. I've got a suggestion. Yeah, man. How about a phased plasma rifle in a 40-watt range? Well, it's got to be guns that I've owned and not the toys, not the not the 3D printed mock-ups from the movie. So it's got to be it's got to be Thursday's episode is generally based around a gun that I've owned. So I can actually share the experience <laughs> with people. But if you have one or you've had one, then or how about like a pulse rifle with a 10 millimeter caseless, whatever, you know, semi-armor <laughs> piercing round. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yep. Grenade launcher. Yeah. Yeah, or flamethrower, you know, whatever works, you know. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching tonight. You guys have yourselves a great weekend. And Kingpin says, nerd. Exactly. Exactly. So shout out to Kingpin for being with us today. Uh, again, single shot, squib, defense dad. Who else was with us? Did we miss anybody? We have one more person that jumped. That No, I think Oof. that's everyone. It's been a good panel. Foos. Foos. Yes. How do I forget the Foos? Yes. Foos was with us Oof, also. Yeah, so Oof. thank you, Foos, for being here. So, all right. You guys take care. Have fun. Be safe. And as you know, we will talk to you soon.